John 13 and verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. In the days of Jesus's, when, when Jesus was on earth, the servant's task on a guest's arrival would be to wash their feet. It would happen on entry. You would sit or recline and your sandals would be taken from you and left at the door, just as would happen in a Middle Eastern country today. A servant would wash your feet. And here, no one has done that. So the Lord Jesus arises, he takes off his outer garments, he wraps a towel around him, he gets a bowl of water and commences with washing the disciples' feet. And there is a lesson that's far more than just washing the disciples' feet here, because it is symbolic of what the Lord Jesus came to do. In Philippians 2, verse 6, it says, Who, though he was on the form of God, in the form of God, he did not account equality with God some, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by coming, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus knew that his death is near. He said when Jesus knew that his hour had come, the, his reference to the hour, we've heard before in John's Gospel, that his hour had not yet come. Now his hour has come. Now the time has come for Jesus to die. Very shortly, Jesus will be betrayed, arrested, tried and crucified. Jesus is going to face pain of unimaginable proportion. When we are facing pain, is it not tempting for us at that point to focus on ourselves? That now is the time for others to show sympathy to me. But I want you to see the servant heart of Jesus, how deep it goes. That on the very threshold of his own pain, the Lord Jesus has the needs of others on his heart and on his mind. And that simple gesture, humbling gesture, 
of washing their feet. These men are tired and Jesus ministers to these men knowing that his hour had come. Sometimes we're called to serve others in the midst of our own tears. But it's, you see, is it not tempting at those times to say, can't you see that I'm really under the cosh here? Can't you see that I'm struggling? It may be in our relationships with our spouse or with our family or the most intimate of relationships. And Jesus is saying, my hour has come. He's before he said, my hour has not yet come. But now Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, he knew what lay before him. And in that moment, I want you to see that our Lord is not thinking of himself. He's thinking of others. He's thinking about his disciples. He's thinking about us. Secondly, this passage, this famous passage, tells us that Jesus loved his disciples to the end. Having loved them to the end, he never gave up on them. He didn't give up on them. Jesus does not give up on his own. The twelve, the twelve who are so slow to believe, even Judas was there. And as this crisis deepens and things are getting worse, they will deny him. They will flee from him. They will run at the moment of his crucifixion. They, there will barely be a disciple present, only John. Yet Jesus loves them to the end. There is something disappointing about these men, yet he loves them to the end. He has been with them for three years. He knows them better than, he knows them, than they know themselves. He knows all about them. He's seen them at their worst. He knows what they're capable of. He gives a prediction about two of them in the upper room that Judas will betray him. Peter will deny him. He sees them in their worst possible light and he loves them. He loves them to the end. He is denying himself. He's about to lay down his life. He's about to die for them. But there's a deeper meaning here. He loved them to the end. And that wasn't just to the end of his life here. No, he loves them to the end, knowing what that love is going to cost him. He knows that he is about to die. And here in the upper room, he's aware of what the real cost of that will be. And he is prepared to love them to the end. He is prepared to go to the very limit. It will cost him suffering and pain, torment, the torments of a condemned man. He will become sin. He will identify with us. He will be dealt with as sin deserves. Sin will be condemned in his body, cursed in his person. There will be no sparing of Jesus. There will be no mitigation of the wrath of God. It will be poured out in full on Jesus. And in the darkness, there will be no light. The sun will refuse to shine. The earth will refuse to hold him in its ground. He will be cast out into the outer darkness where there is the wailing and gnashing of teeth. He will descend into hell in the sense that he will experience it. Because what is hell? Hell is being cut off from God. Hell is being cast out into the outer darkness. Jesus will cry on the cross, the cry of dereliction. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them. Sin was atoned for. He loved them where the last drop of God's wrath on sin will be experienced. And as Jesus reclined in the upper room with his disciples... At the Passover meal with all that was before him. Dawning now. Dawning now that would make you tremble at the very thought of it. What does he do in that, in that moment when he sees what is before him? What does Jesus do? He takes off his outer garments. Wraps a towel around his waist. Takes a basin of water. 
and washes his disciples' feet. It's the third reflection is that he did this for all his people. He did this for his people. He did this for us. Though he was clearly very conscious of his deity. There's this third thing that he's conscious of that John brings to our attention. Jesus knows his divine origin and purpose. And he does all of this in the full consciousness of his own deity. When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. In verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he'd come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. What a wonderful statement of the deity of Christ, that he's, that he's conscious, that he's going back to God, that he, that he came from God, he's going back to God. He had sat at the same table as his father in heaven and he's going back there. And in the full consciousness of his deity, in the full consciousness of his deity, he takes off his outer clothing, wraps a towel around his waist, takes a basin of water and begins to wash his disciples' feet. The impulse, the heart of service is at the very heart of God in himself, the Godhead. God the Father serves the Son God the Son serves the Father and it's traced right back to the Trinity itself. And Peter is amazed, isn't he? Verse 8, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus said, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And how true it was. John makes this understood for us. But what was it that Jesus was demonstrating in the full consciousness of his deity? Well, it's, it's several things. First of all, Jesus turns this, what's happening, into a parable. So when Peter says, you shall never wash my feet, Jesus says in verse 8, if I do not wash you, you shall have no share with me. Unless you're willing to bow before me and allow me to wash away your sin, you have no part with me. You have no fellowship with me. Him, you have no fellowship with Jesus unless he washes away your sin. Unless you, Jesus washes away your sin, unless Jesus makes you clean, you can have no union with him. And that is what he is saying. But then Jesus turns it into a little bit more than that because Peter and you have, this is so Peter, isn't it? This is so Peter, Peter-like so typical of Peter you know Peter out of the frying pan into the fire Peter uttered those two words which can never go together never Lord and Peter says Lord not my feet only but my hands and my head and then Jesus turns that into another parable and says no you're clean and of course our Lord is referring to the custom that before you would have went and eaten the Passover meal you would have bathed you would have been washed so that when you get there you, you you bathe before so when you get there all you have to do is wash your feet because the rest of you is clean you wash your feet because of the dust that would have accumulated between your bathing and your arriving so Jesus says the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet but it's completely clean. And you're clean, but not every one of you. And he's clearly referring to Judas there. But what he's probably alluding to, and it's very helpful for us to see, is the difference between justification, that we're made right with God because of what Jesus has done, and sanctification. Not all of them are clean, but Peter and the eleven are clean. And all they needed to have washed was their feet. And the thing preeminently that Jesus wants us to understand is what he tells us in verse 15. For that I have given you an example that you should that you should that you also should do just as I have done to you. What it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, at the heart of discipleship is to be a servant. At the heart of what it means to be a Christian 
is a willingness to humble yourself as Jesus humbled himself. Now the church has taken that very literally, especially with relation to this passage. In the 7th century in Spain and in Gaul, which was France, uh, in those days, this was introduced almost like a sacrament into the church. The Mennonites and the Seventh, seventh, day, seventh day Adventists still practice foot washing as part of their ritual. The Catholic Church, the Pope, the Patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church, wash feet on occasion. But to do so is to miss the point. The point of what Jesus is saying is the point that Peter himself understood clearly. Because when Peter wrote his uh, letter, his one, his one, one Peter, which we are looking at, and I encourage you to come back and hear that. In 1 Peter 5 verse 5, Peter writes, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That is the application. Amy Carmichael, missionary in India, many of you would have read her beautiful poetry, her life story, would, would sometimes ask, you know, converted high caste Indians to demonstrate the integrity of their conversion by being willing to dig trenches for low caste Indians. I gave you an example that you should do as I to you. I wonder tonight in the face of the cross, in the face of the enormity of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ for us, is there anything that you're not willing to do for your brother or sister? We cannot allow unforgiveness to go on. Is there anything that you're unwilling to do for your brother or sister? And Jesus is saying, get off your high horse and do as I did to you. Is that the essence of what it means to be a Christian? We forgive because Christ has forgiven others, us. We serve others because Christ has served us. It is the gospel. The gospel comes to us to send us out transformed, changed, sinners saved by grace. There is such a profound and humbling lesson there. May God have mercy on us and enable us to do as Jesus did. May today, on Monday Thursday, when if we had been gathering as a church, we would have celebrated the Lord's Supper together. We would have remembered our Lord Jesus. I encourage you to think on, to dwell on, to devote yourself to our Lord Jesus, who in light of the enormity of what laid before him, in light of tomorrow, Good Friday, in light of that, he chose not to think of himself, he chose to think of others. May that be our portion for God's glory, for Jesus' sake. Amen.